Elise. And I'm Nadi. And I want to thank you, we want to thank you so much for being here today. And we want to thank JSConf Asia for having here us together, back together to talk to you about our project, Data Sketches. Let's start from the very beginning. Nadi and I actually met each other online virtually in a private data visualization Slack channel in the fall of 2015. We didn't actually meet each other in real life until April the following year at OpenBizConf 2016 in Boston, where we both had the honor of speaking separately. And in the following three days, we hit it off really, really well. So well that a few months later, back home, when Nadi put, when Nadi put up her SVG tutorials from her talks, I went through them with vigor. And I started up a conversation with Nadi, and that conversation somehow, somehow uh, <laughs> ended up with us lamenting the fact that we hadn't completed as many data visualization projects as we had wanted in the previous year. And that was when I got my idea. And I got together all of my courage, fully expecting to be rejected, and asked Nadi, do you want to collaborate with me? And happily, happily, she said yes. And that's how Data Sketches started. So in the following week, we figured out that we both liked the idea where we would create a visualization each month around a specific topic. And to see how two people would create two visualizations starting from the same seed, this topic, and then diverging into different paths based on our own interests and history. And besides sharing this end result, we also wanted to write about the creation process. And we split this up into the three pillars that we find most important, data, sketching, and coding. And initially, we thought we could pull it off you know, with about five to six hours a week. But as usual, real life really doesn't care about plans, especially coding plans. So since starting in July of 2016, we've clocked many, many hours into creating our visualizations each month. And during this talk, we'd like to take you through some of the lessons that we learned, challenges faced, and insights that we gathered along the way. So let's start from the very beginning, the data gathering process. The two of us sometimes get asked this question. Do you get your data first and then come up with the idea for your visualizations? Or do you get your idea first? And the answer for us is always, always idea first. For the month of October, I decided that I wanted to put emojis on the former, oh, is there an in it? Should be. Mm, okay. I decided that I wanted to put <laughs> emojis on their faces. Oh no. Yeah. Where is it? Cat. cat. Oh, it's the cat now. OK. Thank you. <laughs> we should have checked that. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah, so for the October months, we <laughs> decided that I wanted to put emojis on former, former President Mr. Obama and Mrs. Obama's faces. Ah, there we go. <laughs> now you see their faces. And so for this project, I went and gathered all of their late night talk show appearances and their corresponding YouTube videos, took a screenshot every single time that they talked so that I can put emojis on their faces. And there's some really fun ones in here. <laughs> but <laughs> this, this project started because I was trying to figure out what to do with the data set of all the late night talk shows. And I was talking to my our friend, Eric, and he said to me, wouldn't it be cool if you could run facial detection on the video and correlate their emotions with what they're saying? And I was like, hey, Eric, you realize I only have one month to do this. And I was like, hey, Eric, challenge accepted. So I started by manually gathering all of the late night talk show appearances of Mr. and Mrs. Obama off of IMDb. I used the YouTube search API to get all the videos from the corresponding host YouTube channels. Used a new package called YouTube DL to download all of the videos and their captions. Wrote a script to get the timestamps from each of those captions. You then took all of those timestamps 
and use Fluent FM MPEG to take a screenshot for every one of those timestamps. Upload each of the screenshots to Google Vision API, which is this super fun API that detects for every picture how many faces there are on the screen and whether they're happy, mad, sad, or wearing a hat. <laughs> and I took the aggregated annotate, aggregate, sorry, and then I grouped the annotated image data with the caption data to get the final data set. And I learned quite a fun lesson here. And there's two parts to it. The first being, be curious. Find something that you're really excited and interested in, and let that excitement and curiosity guide you through the project and motivate you. And second, that once you've found that topic that you're interested in, get creative with your data gathering process because there is so much data out there. And you can get your data set by either manual entry or with automated scripts, which I've learned there is a node or R package out there for practically every single thing I want to do under the sun, as long as I play responsibly and legally. So once you've gathered the data, the next big thing is actually preparing the data. And for August of last year, or maybe a year and a half ago, uh, <laughs> the, the obvious theme is the Olympics, especially since we're both big fans. And I ended up visualizing all 5,000 gold medal winners since the very first games in 1896. So each of these circles here is a group of similar sports, such as water sports or ball sports. And within that, each slice or feather is its own unique sport, such as athletics. Then we have the first version on the inside going out to 2016. The reddish background has the female events, and the blue background has the male events. And finally, each medal itself is colored according to the continent in which the country lies that won. So Europe is blue, America is red, Africa is black, and so on. And you can see, for example, that in the very first editions of the Olympic Games, tug of war was an official Olympic sport. <laughs> Too bad they took that out. So I found the data for this piece from two articles published by The Guardian for the 2012 Games in London. And after getting a rough shape of the visual on my screen, I noticed that some very obvious medals were missing from 2012, like hockey. So suddenly, my confidence in this data set dropped drastically, even coming from such a respectable source. And therefore, I had to get a sense of the overall accuracy. But I didn't want to have to manually check 5,000 medals. So I found a proxy instead. On Wikipedia, I could find lists that contained the number of events that occurred during each edition, which I then compared to the number of gold medals I had in my data set. And if there was a discrepancy, I would investigate further to figure out where and why. And that's how I found out that for some of the editions, the horses were also in the data set which made for an interesting read to suddenly see Princess and Sissy and Lady Murka as women winning gold in the Olympics. Uh, eventually, I managed to figure out each of these discrepancies and made adjustments to my data to get it to the point where I trusted it again. So my lesson here was that I really need to get a feeling of accuracy and completeness of my data. Missing data can be harder to find than wrong data. And you don't have to check every value, but think about taking sums and counts and averages and comparing this to either plain common sense or even better, a different data source. So before data sketches, I actually used to go directly from my data gathering process into my code. But Nadi convinced me to give sketching and ideation and prototyping a try, and I'm so glad that she did. For my very first sketch lesson, happened in September, where our topic was travel. And I took 20,000 colors, five primary colors from 4,000 images, grouped each of the colors by the trip that I took the photo, and, ag and then arranged them by the day that it was taken on. And this is one of my personal favorites, because I learned a lot about myself through this project, mainly that I had always known that I loved taking photos of nature, so the sky and trees and mountains and oceans. So it made sense to me that I would have a lot of blues and greens in this visualization. But the thing that I was really confused about was the fact that for some reason, there were a lot of reds and oranges and yellows also. And I knew for sure that I was not waking up for any sunrises. So when I 
took a look at the underlying photos, I found that they were actually food pictures. So this 2014 trip to Tokyo and Japan, you can tell apparently all I did was eat. <laughs> but this one to Europe in 2015, this was to Iceland, and there were some absolutely gorgeous waterfalls. And although this is one of my favorite visualizations, it didn't actually start out so well. In fact, it started out disastrously. After I had gathered all of my data, my data being all of my photos, and gotten all of the colors out of them, I went straight into the sketching without even taking a look at what my data looked like. And so even though I had really great intentions, which was that I wanted to lay out my colors by the x-axis being the time of day that I took the pictures or where I took the pictures, and the y-axis being the year that I took the pictures, and again, with good intention, because I wanted to see if there was a pattern and when or where that I was taking my pictures. But <laughs> once I have put the actual data into the screen, into my code, this is what happened. I like to lovingly call this piece man peeing into puddle. And although I'm quite fond of it, I knew that it wasn't something I can publish as my final data sketches. So I looked through the data a lot, and um, I went through different iterations, really explored it until I got to the point that you saw earlier. And so I really took that to heart in September and applied it to the next month in October with the Obama visualization you saw earlier. And after I had gathered all of my data, I had listed out all of my data attributes, I looked through and found my min and max and my extremes, and I really got a sense of my data before I sketched out any of my ideas and designs, and this is one of them. And as you can see, I was really happy because there was almost a one-to-one -one translation between my sketches and my code, and my final code. So my very first sketch lesson that was so important was to ex always, always explore the data before starting to sketch. List out the attributes, dig into the extremes, so that I can get a good understanding of the data that I'm trying to visualize. And my sketches are often very simple, only focusing on the main abstract shape that I want to fit my data into. You know, colors and layout and details. These are things I only vaguely think about, but don't act on until I have the data on my screen. This, I find that there's just no, no use to spend any time on these things until I figured out that the data actually works once I've morphed it into my main shape. For the Olympics piece, for example, I was actually inspired by the shape of a peacock feather, placing emphasis on the more recent additions. Uh, but I had no idea if that would look all right once I finally placed all 5,000 medals together, so I had to see if the general shape would work before moving on. Oh, I, I laid out the feathers, and of course it took a few steps before I got that right, but it, luckily I saw that eventually it did show potential with the actual data. But with networks, it's really tricky to create uh, a sketch that is more than just circles connected by a line, because with networks, the best visual form is so inherent to the actual connections present within the data. And for the October month, when Shirley dove into presidents, I went into royalty. And I've always been intrigued by how intermarriage the royals really are. You know, are they all cousins twice removed in some way? And luckily I found this giant genealogy data set online that contained the family tree of the European royal houses. Uh, it was from 1992, so I had to spend a night on Wikipedia adding one or two more generations to the main line of succession. Uh, but I was already super happy to have this data available. And to show you the, uh, the end result, here we go. So the main, the, the current royal leaders are the biggest stars, and everybody is connected to their parents, their partner, and their children. And if you hover over a person, slowly, the grid shows how far six degrees of separation would reach into this web. So this one is connected to three current royal leaders, for example. But when I started out with this data set, I had no idea what it contained. So I just sort of placed it on the web using the most basic network settings. And then this happened. Oops, that's too far. can do it. It's, my computer is always not very happy when I try and share this. Right, this happened. It sort of blew up, and that wasn't really helpful. It was not showing me anything. 
So I thought, well, maybe I can sort of make the gravity a little bit bigger, but then I got uh, a useless hairball. Not helpful either, so I thought, well, I can, I can color everybody by year of birth, which still didn't help. But luckily, in a browser, you can have gravity depend on a variable. So I pulled this web apart by year of birth as well, which was more interesting, but it was still a rather uninsightful bundle. And at this point, I'd already invested several hours into playing with the network settings, trying different kinds of connections, and playing with my data. And I was really ready to just give up and try a different angle, like how much are the royals spending these days or something. But I gave it one last try. And that's when I decided to focus on the current royal leaders. So I placed these in a line, and then I let the vertical gravity depend on which of these royal leaders you're most closely related to. And that's when I finally saw it, insights. For example, that the Queen of Denmark is actually very central to this web, but that the Prince of Monaco line separated more than, well, almost 200 years ago. And only at this point did I start worrying about more of the visual design aspects of this visualization. And networks often remind me of constellations, and with my astronomy background, I have a bias for all things space, so I, I just had to turn it into a starry night. And I could have never designed this visualization beforehand in Illustrator. I had to go hand in hand with the actual data and continue to sort of to see how the results of my actions would look on the actual data to see if the results were both <coughs> engaging and insightful. <coughs> oh wait, I'm up still. No, yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> We've done this loads of times. <laughs> different <That's> content. <laughs> yes. So as you might expect, actually most of our hours are, are spend on getting the data on the screen. And, and this is some of our perhaps less obvious coding lessons. So for our very first month, the topic was movies. And it was pretty clear to me that I wanted to do something with The Lord of the Rings, which is, uh, well, my favorite trilogy. And I thought that with the popularity of the movies that there would be loads of data available, <laughs> but that didn't turn out to be true at all. And, but I did manage to find a true gem. So somebody had created a data set that contained the number of words spoken by each character in each scene of all three extended editions of The Lord of the Rings. I mean, how amazing is that? <laughs> I knew I had to visualize that data somehow. Um, and I, I wanted to focus on the number of words spoken by these characters of the fellowship at the different locations of the movies. Uh, but as you may be able to see from the screenshot, or maybe not, uh, there is no location information in it. So together with the scripts that are available online and my own memory, having seen the movies way too often, I just manually added location information to each of the about 800 rows of <laughs> fellowship data. So a bit of dedication can go a long way. I started sketching some ideas and then eventually got to this where the members of the fellowship would be placed in the center and the locations spread around them in a circle. And they would be connected by these strings where the width of a string on the outside would represent the number of words spoken by that character at that location. But sadly, this chart form doesn't actually exist, at least not in any tool that I was aware of. But it reminded me of something that did exist, um, and that's called a chord diagram. So I thought, well, maybe I can somehow transform this chord diagram into my sketch. So here's the most basic stripped of all text chord diagram. And for me, it was fundamental to see if I could at least get these chords, as they're called here, flowing towards the center, which took less time than anticipated, which is pretty rare for me in coding. But getting rid of that space, adding in the actual Lord of the Rings data and some more appropriate colors. Uh, well, we have nine members of the fellowship, so I had to make sure that the centers lined up at the right vertical location, but this was just looking way too squished. So what about if I pull the two halves apart? Okay, that works, but now these strings, they were looking pretty odd, especially in the top and bottom. So I finally, finally dove into learning how to write my own SVG paths because all of our visualizations, well, practically all, is built up out of SVGs. And that took quite a while, but it was also quite fun. Uh, and that's how I sort of ended up with this new kind of chart that is mutated from D3's chord diagram. And many people have done amazing things that they, they share online. And so even if you think you are creating something new, you don't always have to start from scratch. You know, try and pick a thing that most closely resembles your idea or design and start adjusting that. Remix what's out there already. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, we dream up things and we sketch out things that just don't seem to have anything out there that we can base it off of. For that same month of movies, 
I did this thing called Film Flowers, where I visualized the top blockbuster movies, the summer blockbuster movies of the last two and a half decades, reimagined as flowers. Each of the petals are parental guidance ratings. Each of the colors are different genres. And the number and the size of the petals are their corresponding IMDb ratings out of 10. And so there's some really, really beautiful ones in here, like The Dark Knight Rises, Inception. And I personally always love Harry Potter. But my absolute, absolute favorite that I love sharing with everybody is the 1997 Batman and Robin because of how teeny and tiny and cute it is. So when I first published this project, I got asked, oh, how hard was it to do? How did you do it? Did it take a long time? And the answer is actually that it's quite easy. All you need is a good understanding of SVG paths and in particular, the cubic Bezier curve command. So let's take, for example, this cherry blossom. So the way that we want to draw it is we start out with a petal. And for that particular curve, the way that I like to think about it is we start with a point, in this case at 0, 0, and we draw a straight line to the ending, that purple point. And then we take the blue and green anchor points and we nudge it out and nudge it apart until we get the curve that we want. I then drew two more lines, drew a curve on the other end, and then we have the petal. I put in a few more petals, rotated it them appropriately, put in the colors, and that was it. Quite simple. So the code lesson here is really, really understand your tool set. In that case, in our cases, the, our tool sets are SVG and Canvas and D3. And in particular, my favorite is SVG paths and the curve command, because with that under my belt, I can truly, truly draw anything on the screen that I want for some really unique results. And we also had a lot of fun playing around with math over the past months. So here's my addition to our collaboration month with uh, Google News Lab. And being a non-native English speaker, I wanted to focus on translations. So what do other languages want to have translated into English by using Google Translate? From the most translated word for 10 chosen languages to the top 10 for each of these languages, and finally, the similarities between these languages. And for this final visualization, I actually wanted to uh, look at these, these similarities and have each of the words that two languages had in common in their top 10 be presented by a line. But actually, I wanted to have all of these visuals to be completely built up out of words and letters. So actually, I wanted to replace these lines by the words themselves that they represented. But after I'd finally coded it out, I immediately saw it was a big mess. So I had to compromise and only place a word on the most central, um, the line going toward the central point. But then it became really important that all of these words were placed in the most upright manner possible for readability. But they gave quite some convoluted calculations in terms of the text paths that I had to calculate uh, to place these words on. And that became glaringly obvious once you click one of these outer circles and move it inward, which is not quite what I think a user would expect to happen. And that's where math and uh, you know, logic solving came to the rescue. It took a few pages from my notebook, but eventually I ended up figuring out a way to implement a solution. So now it should work more as somebody might expect it to. And what I'm doing is really more of a hack. So once somebody clicks one of these other languages, I fade out the words and then I immediately replace all of these lines by their final state, but reverse engineer to look like the initial state before slowly transitioning them to the final state. Uh, so the lesson here is really, really simple. It's learn to love math and especially geometry if you don't already, because they are usually your best friends in finding solutions to these visual problems. In the December of 2016, I published this visualization called an interactive visualization of every line in Hamilton. I don't know any, if anybody's heard of the musical, but as the user scrolls down the screen, these dots follow them. And each of these dots represent a series of lines in the musical. The, and as they keep scrolling, I show them the analysis that I've done, as well as 
the filters that they can play with to follow along with my analysis until they scroll to the very, very end and I give them that same tool where they can, for themselves, filter by any set of characters, conversations, and themes, and dig into the remaining lines and songs to do their own analysis. But something really strange happened last September, which was that I noticed that when I was loading up my visualization, it was being really, really slow. In fact, this is a video of the actual experience. There, it was taking between two to three seconds between each repaint. It's excruciating. And I knew that it wasn't anything that I had done because I hadn't touched this code in about nine months. And so I figured that it was probably something to do with a browser update to Canvas. And because I knew that that was something that I didn't quite understand and hadn't been keeping track of, I turned to, obviously, Twitter for help. And the miraculous thing, an amazing thing, is that within a few hours, some really amazing people, including Jake, who may or may not be in this audience, came and kind of figured out what was going on and helped me debug both on Chrome and Firefox. And they helped me deduce that what was happening was that because I had used Canvas to draw those dots animating in the background, and I had done a canvas with a height of 16,000 pixels, the full height of the document, scaled it by 2x for 32,000, is causing absolute mayhem on the memory. And that's what was causing the bug. And I had originally done this because I had wanted the user, the reader, to have the experience of the dots following them as they scrolled down the screen. And it took a good week of going through my nine months old code, which was absolutely painful. But I was able to refactor my canvas height from 16,000 pixels down to 3,000 pixels while maintaining that same dots following you effect for real, some really smooth, buttery, buttery smooth uh, experience. And I learned the most important lesson that September, which was that up until that point, I had thought of my tool set as SVG, Canvas, D3, React, whatever I needed to render the actual visualization. But up until that point, I was ignoring my most important tool set of all, the web itself. And I had learned that I need to really, really understand the entirety of my tool set, in my case being keeping track of page performance, browser updates, and what's coming down the pipeline. So since starting, we've realized that we can find data in the weirdest of places, that data preparation can reveal some really weird quirks in that data set, uh, that sketching helps weed out thinking errors, but that you can also design with code, that SVG pads are amazing and math is too, but we already knew that, of course. Uh, and that, I, especially as data visual, visualizers, uh, we should not neglect the web or a browser as part of our toolkit and not instead only be talking about D3 or Canvas and Illustrator and these things. Now, when we started, we didn't set out to be confronted or learn all of these things. We, we just wanted to have fun. And in that, we definitely succeeded. Uh, so even though the year has already come and gone, we still have a month or two to go. There are still a few empty spots there. Uh, and that's because even though we were having fun, at the end, we noticed that we had taken on too much on our plate, and we decided to take things a little bit more slowly. So if you want to, you can still follow us in our final months of data munging, sketching, and coding up our ideas into often fun and weird and overly elaborate visualizations. Thank you very much for your attention.